Uh, thanks for joining me today, people in the room, and also our guests on webinar land. It's nice to have you with us. Uh, I'm the director here at Statewide Clinical Support Services and Metro North Mental Health Alcohol Drug Service, and I'm here today to talk about the wonderful topic of methamphetamine with a particular focus on harm reduction. Uh, before I go on, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we're gathered and are talking today, paying particular respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Given, I guess, some of the particular um, qualities and, and characteristics of this drug, harm reduction is particularly important and so that's why we've decided to dedicate this workshop to um, particular harm reduction strategies around methamphetamine. Uh, all this work has been part of a project funded by uh, the, the department to look at methamphetamine in Queensland and there's been, and I really want to acknowledge some of the work of my colleagues both within the team, in particular uh, Michelle Taylor, Karen Hassan, uh, Dr. Nikola Yanovitz and Sean Popovich who work specifically specifically and dedicatedly on this project over the past few months to get it where it is and I look forward to launching on those tools very shortly. Yeah, and this is why we're doing it and whilst some of the media heat seems to have come out of this particular drug, uh, it's still this is particularly a very big issue for workers and services and families and communities alike and um, whilst the media heat might have died down a little bit, the, uh, the focus is definitely still there for us as practitioners. Uh, before I go into the more detail around the harm reduction advice specifically, I thought it might be useful just to go through some of the few basics, my methamphetamine 101. Um, and so I'll do this really, really quickly because a lot of you might have seen this before, but it's not a new drug. Amphetamine itself has been around since the late 1800s and methamphetamine uh, was developed in 1893 and crystal meth in 1919. So it's almost been 100 years that we've had this drug. Ice is not a new drug, it's just a new wave of the drug in terms of its use. Uh, it looks like that and the little uh, CH3 methyl kind of molecule there is what makes it so potent compared to, compared to amphetamine, sorry. Uh, we're aware that there's different types of meth. Uh, at the lower end of the purity spectrum, we have powdered speed. Uh, in the middle, we kind of have a, 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 the paste version, which is called base, which is oily, and in the more potent, uh, stronger form is ice or crystal methamphetamine. Uh, it's important that we know that all of these drugs are methamphetamine, just the purity and the form are different. Uh, we also have prescription medications that contain amphetamine or amphetamine-like substances, such as Ritalin, dexamphetamine, etc. There's a picture. And this is the drug that's captured, uh, well, this is the focus of a lot of our efforts at the moment due to the increased uh, risks and um, problems associated with it. Uh, and really quickly, so quite a number of Australians have used methamphetamine. Approximately 7% of the population have lifetime use rates, so that's quite high. Uh, of the, of uh, the population, 2% have reported to have used it in the last 12 months, though some follow-up research by Louise Degenhart and co. Uh, have suggested that rate is a little bit conservative and it's possible that maybe it's closer to 3% of the population have used the last 12 months and about 2% of those have used in the last week. So. Um, at a conservative estimate, that's what we've got. Uh, of that 2% who used in the last 12 months, approximately 16% represented the circle uh, would use weekly, and these are the ones that we would suspect are dependent, regular users of methamphetamine. About the same amount are using monthly, so they're maybe not quite dependent, but they're certainly potentially experiencing a lot of the harms and maybe on the pathway to dependence. And the bulk of users uh, would use it more situationally or recreationally, so to enhance particular events, festivals, holidays, parties, etc. And that's the bulk of the profile of users. Uh, this is a slide that shows why methamphetamine or crystal methamphetamine is such an issue, is that switch from uh, base uh, and powder meth to the crystal form over the past you know, five years in particular. And with that increase in the availability of the higher strengths, higher purity is where all the problems have come from not necessarily a huge increase in the numbers of users. Though, given the prevalence of the profile of the drug, we are all expecting there to be an increase in the number of users when the next National Drug Strategy Household Survey results come out um, next year, I believe. Uh, so this also shows that increase in purity. So this is the annual median purity of, of seized methamphetamine. So that, that huge jump up to 62% from uh, more around the 10 or 9% in the late 2010s. 
this is the amount of ice seized at the border. So this is obviously reflects not only an increase in the amount being imported, but also the increased focus on that particular drug by law enforcement would combine to see that, that rapid or dramatic increase. Uh, and this is the annual, uh, the average street price of a gram of ice. Um, now we know it's a lot cheaper than $675 now. It's reports and you will know in the floor and in webinar land from your clients, but anywhere like $300 to $400 a gram of ice is what we are currently hearing about. So it's dropped considerably. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. Again, you would assume that supply is so high that the price has dropped down. I've also heard that some of the manufacturers have worked out how to cut ice in the process. So it's probably a little bit cheaper as well uh, through uh, that without that have been noticeably cut in the production of the crystals. Uh, this is what people in practitioner land are seeing is an increase in hospital separations for overdose due to poisoning, so a toxic overdose, and this is for uh, psychotic uh, presentations in hospital emergency departments and mental health wards. That dramatic spike, again, is related to that increase in purity. Uh, really quickly, we know that methamphetamine works on these three neurotransmitters, noradrenaline, serotonin, and dopamine, with dopamine being the primary neurotransmitter that it affects. This slide, uh, although a little bit inaccurate, in some ways which I won't bother you with today but it does demonstrate that that huge spike in dopamine that methamphetamine causes is why uh, first of all it's such a highly Moorish and reinforcing drug that flood of dopamine as the, the brain's reward chemical uh, is very powerful as you can see there which is why users uh, tend to want to go back to use it particularly if I guess for some users whose lives are a little bit crummy or not great this drug can make them feel for maybe the first time in a long time a sense of real well-being uh, confidence and that things are okay in life and you can see that for some of those users it's such an attractive drug to keep using again to try to keep to maintain that particular feeling uh, you will know the effects, but there they are quickly at lower doses, it's dilated pupils and increased alertness, and at high doses through to euphoria, um, reduced appetite, jaw clenching, and at higher doses again, tremor, anxiety, panic, increased body rate, heart temperature, and perspiration. So, um, I would make the point here that it's important that we don't. Um, uh, assume that we can pick people who are on methamphetamine just by how they present for a couple of reasons. If you're a regular user, a lot of these symptoms will not be as apparent, so you may not get the jaw clench or the dilated pupils. Once you're dependent, you will look perfectly normal, so you will not be able to pick if that person is on methamphetamine or not. Uh, we also know that some mental health sort of presentations might look quite similar, uh, such as sort of the manic phase of bipolar disorder presentation, etc. So uh, don't assume just because some of these symptoms are in a client that that's what it is, you need to ask or be told. Uh, the strength of the effect depends on a number of factors, like most drugs, the amount used, how often it's used, the route of administration or how it's taken, and then there's a whole bunch of individual body factors such as your age, weight, body type and pre-existing mental uh, medical conditions. Uh, the another one which I didn't mention here is the environment or the location in which you take it, but also affect how it is experienced. That's that principle of drug set setting, that there's uh, the characteristics of the drug, your individual personal characteristics and then the location which combine to culminate in how a drug is experienced. And these are important things to consider when thinking about harm reduction uh, because they all have a role to play in how we can uh, minimise some of those harms. Uh, finally, uh, it's important to know that methamphetamine users, unlike other substance users, almost always, almost always, always are poly substance users. They either use uh, methamphetamine in combination with generally alcohol and cannabis uh, or other benzodiazepines, other drugs as well. Uh, we under probably around the globe, Japan is probably one of the few populations that have a population of pure methamphetamine only using populations. Uh, the rest of the Western world in particular are all mainly poly substance users. And so when we deal with clients who present with methamphetamine, it's important that we ask about other drugs and deal with them as well, uh, particularly because obviously methamphetamine keeps people awake for a long time. They're all long, awake a lot longer to consume and use a whole range of other substances at the same time. So how can we respond? Uh, so what I wanted to focus on today is, well, and, and going back to our good old basics of harm minimization, the policies of, well, and the approach of demand, supply, and harm reduction. Uh, look, it's 
uh, no surprise that the bulk of the responses uh, across all levels of government is around supply reduction, stopping the availability and the access to drugs. Uh, but a lot less is given to harm reduction, and so, and it is a quite a tricky area. You need to know how to do it right. There's a certain level of um, proficiency or knowledge you need to know before you do it. Uh, and so, I'll look at harm reduction and a bit of demand reduction strategies uh, over the next uh, 40 minutes. So yeah, let's dive into harm reduction. So why is harm reduction so important? Um, so methamphetamine use, like other drug use, uh, is a chronic relapsing condition. There are high, high rates of relapse with methamphetamine in particular. Uh, we know because of the potency of the drug that there are a range of particular and very significant harms associated with meth use. Uh, some of those harms tend to be quite spectacular as people working in emergency departments, in police, and frontline health and mental health systems will attest to. Uh, often it's characterized by quite aggressive behavior in some cases or uh, quite high levels of anxiety and, and um, paranoia. Um, having said that, most people who use methamphetamine cut back or quit all by themselves eventually without accessing treatment or other support. One of the best things about meth is that quite quickly it becomes a lot of the undesirable or unwanted effects of it become quite apparent and rise to the surface, which means that many users don't get the same return that they did uh, at their initial stages of use, which stops people or makes people want to cut back or quit, or a lot of people. Uh, for those who do access treatment, the average wait time between their initial use and their first treatment episode or treatment access in an AOD service is approximately eight years, according to Nicole Lee. So um, that's a long time for people to be using without any sort of a dedicated AOD specialist intervention. So wherever we can, we need to get harm reduction advice and information to our clients whenever they stumble across us or we stumble across them in the health system or otherwise. Uh, also, as I talk about later, there are very few and really if any pharmacotherapy treatment or medicine options available for methamphetamine. So we really have to rely on our basics around heart, good harm reduction and good AOD treatment work uh, in terms of our more kind of uh, withdrawal management and, and counselling talking therapies. A quick note about harm reduction before I go on as well uh, and I, I understand that there's a little video coming out about this from Dovetail so which goes into this into more detail but whenever we do harm reduction we need to do it properly and there's a few things a few ingredients to good harm reduction first of all it has to be the right message um, if we're giving information advice to substance users we need to know that we're 100% accurate in the information that we give uh, because that information is often shared by them to their peers and other drug using friends and if we get it wrong it's all going to go wrong down the line. Uh, there's also a lot of myths information and a lot of myth mythology around substance use that needs correcting. And we can't assume that because someone's been using a substance for a while that they know how to use it properly because it's quite possible that they have a very strong belief about a particular practice and it might actually be totally or probably not the best or could be totally wrong and we need to correct them whenever we can. Really important that it's delivered to the right person. We don't do universal uh, harm reduction uh, around illicit substances generally. Um, you know, we don't go into schools and start teaching people around how to safely inject methamphetamine, of course. You really target it and ramp it up depending on the level of use or the patterns of behaviour that we're witnessing. So if we're obviously a client is accessing an NSP for the first time or is hanging around with a bunch of other injectors, that might be a sign that it's time to do some proactive um, safe injecting chats. Uh, we would do harm reduction around substances that we know people are already using, not ones that they may not have ever tried yet. So you match it depending on where the client is at and what they're currently using and the rate at which they're using. Uh, you need to deliver it at the right time and in the right place. Uh, it's often very difficult to do any, any substantial harm reduction advice giving when clients are very intoxicated or if they uh, have scored and are itching to go and use, their attention won't be very good at particularly that time. Uh, often it's uh, good to do it in a, when you, at a time when you've got a you know, a, a few, at least a good 15, 20 minutes at your disposal so you can really interrogate and, and ask questions and provide some decent amount of advice. Uh, often you want to do it in a place that's private. Uh, so it does, it is about finding those opportunities when they are and, and wedging your harm reduction advice where you can. Um, and sometimes those opportunities are few and far between, particularly with uh, very regular dependent users. Um, so think of strategies to get them in a, in a quite comfortable place so you can provide that advice. Uh, it has to be delivered in a way that will be acceptable to that person. Uh, 
but a lot of our clients are used to the just say no message and the wagging finger around their drug taking behaviours. Uh, so we recommend that you avoid that sort of approach. Uh, use jar avoid jargon and ambiguous language. You need to be really clear and explain things. Don't assume just because they're a, a long term user that they know all of the terms that uh, you may use in your everyday work. And I think really importantly, we need a balance between the aspirational and the realistic. Uh, of course, we want our clients to uh, either stop using or decrease their use and use very safely. Uh, but we need to be really realistic around the context of how drug use actually happens. Uh, and understanding the environments, the households, the events where drug taking is happening, whether they're uh, at home uh, on the weekend or at parties, uh, it is quite likely that you know, a lot of our clients are using a lot of drugs on top of each other in very risky environments. And no matter how much we say how that is dangerous and that they shouldn't do that is likely to change that necessarily. Uh, we need to provide advice which is really based on the realities of how drugs are used and the context in which that happens. Um, so that's that's a bit of tricky how you describe that. Uh, and as, when I say that it's also it's important that we even though we know our clients are using and maybe using every few days or every day that we still make sure we present abstinence as an option for our clients, even though it may not be something that they're realistically ready for. Uh, we can't forget that that is what we're expected to present as part of the spectrum of, op of options available to them from abstinence to keeping using the same way that they are. So yeah, that's a bit, we can go into a lot more detail about that, but there's some basic key points around good harm reduction. So let's get into the tips and tricks that you can use with your clients. So as with everything, we encourage you to start with good basic ed information and psychoeducation. And one approach we recommend is just ask them what do they already know. It allows them an opportunity, to, our clients, to talk, to maybe show what they are aware of, and also shows to you where any gaps in their knowledge might be. Uh, you might explain what, you know, some basic things that we might assume, like what it is, that's a stimulant, obviously, uh, the effects that I talked about before. You might want to try to explain in, in layman terms how it works around the basic neurotransmitters of brain chemistry in very simple language. Uh, explaining tolerance and dependence are useful, again, uh, and also confirming the legal status, particularly for our younger clients who may not have had any experience with the law, they may not realise uh, some of the ins and outs around what's legal and illegal, particularly around if the use of prescription medication is the case. As I mentioned before, uh, it's a good to explain the different forms and clarify that they all are, all are methamphetamine. And asking about different names, I know the drug buy can help with that. Um, in some of the research and focus testing we did in developing our tools, uh, a whole bunch of names came out, and including the use of the word crack, uh, which can stump a few workers, because obviously crack is a totally different drug, that's crack cocaine, and we don't ever, um, as far as I know, maybe some people in the room see, but I haven't really heard much crack getting around in the street in our user groups very much. Uh, and so if people do use crack, we need to clarify and maybe check that they're not actually talking about crystal methamphetamine. Um, we also discovered that a lot of users, particularly longer term users, still think that powdered speed is amphetamine. Um, but since like the 90s, all it's all methamphetamine. We really don't get amphetamine anymore in Australia. Uh, and again, don't forget to ask about use of prescription medications that contain AT ATSs. Uh, so some of the key messages we want to give is that obviously the higher the purity of the form you're using, the less you need. Um, that even though you might be getting your ice from the same dealer, uh, that purity can change from batch to batch, even though it looks the same. Particularly now that you know that way of um, uh, cutting it in the forming of the crystals is around it, that purity can. Well, drop and rise all the time. And obviously we need to be clear that all use carries risk, that there is no safe level of methamphetamine use, um, despite what people might think. It might be useful to talk about frequency, uh, and you know, there's a number of ways you can do this. You can use a chart like this and get them and explain it, or ask how much they've used in the last week, or the last fortnight, or the last month, or the last three months, and try to get a picture of where their use is. And this might get, let you give you a picture about whether they're a, an occasional situational user or whether they're more of a regular or dependent user. Because depending on that will, do, will guide your harm reduction advice. If they're a dependent user, they're more likely to experience a lot of other issues, particularly around sleep, health, skin problems that a, a, an occasional or recreational user may not ever experience. And so understanding the frequency is, uh, is good, and these are some points that you can make uh, to try to uh, identify whether, for a client, if 
here that or she is more dependent or not. And the point we're trying to make here is obviously the fr more frequently someone uses meth, the more problems they're likely to experience. Um, we, I'm really keen, and a lot of the workers are really good about talking to their clients about planning ahead. Uh, and some of the things we would advise around methamphetamine use is, is that you eat first. Obviously, it suppresses your appetite. So if you have a good meal on board, you're less likely to experience uh, poor nutrition or, or the other um, effects of not having any food on board. Uh, having water handy and, and staying hydrated is also really important. We're trying to get our clients to set limits about how much and for how long they will use. It's really important is, um, what do they call it, intentionality or um, you know, so if you think you're going to have a huge weekend, it's more than likely that you are, but if you can talk to your clients about verbalising around min minimising or limiting their use, it's more likely to, um, to occur. Uh, again, taking into account the purity of the form, if using a new batch, use it a little bit first and to wait before having some more. And that can be a bit tricky, and I'll talk about that soon, around route of administration, because obviously different routes have uh, reached peak plasma or blood concentration at different times, so that'll depend on how you take it. And we always recommend that our clients avoid using alone, uh, to use around people they trust in safe places. Uh, we encourage our clients to be safe sex ready, and uh, that's condom and lube in particular for methamphetamine, and where possible to have a buddy system where you and a mate might look out for each other and keep each other safe. Uh, we obviously want to advise our clients to avoid driving and to plan not to drive when using methamphetamine. And it's important to explain that a lot of people, a lot of clients and people think that they can drive better when they are uh, affected or using meth. Uh, and you know, certainly there are some industries where they would use methamphetamine to stay awake and stay focused, particularly for long, long haul drives, etc. Uh, but it's important to clarify that it, methamphetamine makes people think that they're safer than they really are. And some of the performance effects that have been documented around meth use include, you know, that agitation, inability to focus, attention on divided tasks, inattentiveness, restlessness, mode excitation, excitation uh, increased or delayed reaction time and time distortion. So pulling out in front of cars or in gaps in traffic is more difficult than people think depressed reflexes, poor balance and coordination, and inability to follow directions. Um, we also want to remind our clients that it's against law to drive while using meth, and um, that roadside drug testing can detect meth in their saliva. Now, a lot of people ask us how long can it be detected in saliva, and the answer is we don't know. Um, we know that it could, it's likely to be a number of days, and I think we need to say that to our clients as well, is that we actually, there's no published data on how long it takes in saliva. And mainly because there's so many variables around um, how often you use, how much you used at your last use to, to determine how long it stays in the system. But you can comfortably say that's likely to be a number of days. Uh, so it's really important we don't specify that and have a, an angry client who says, you told me that it would be three days and then it came, turned up positive. Um, it's important to talk about uh, some of the adverse reactions or bad reactions might be a term that's more palatable to clients that it's not too uncommon for clients to have a bad reaction when they take a bit too much meth and it's characterised by feeling uncomfortable, agitated, anxious, a mild headache, mild nausea and being hot and sweaty. Uh, in these instances either they or whoever they're looking after should find somewhere quiet to relax until some of the effects wear off, that someone stays with them, that they sip water, not gulp water and if, if at all worried, seek medical help. And I think we really need to stress that. We don't want to downplay the seriousness of any of these events, and that's why stressing that it's only a mild headache or mild nausea, anything more than that, they should really seek uh, medical help. Uh, the sipping water is important. Some people gulp water to try to deal with some of those bad reactions. And look, it's also a difficult one to explain to clients, but there is a risk of hyponatremia where you overload with water and it can cause uh, organ failure. That's why we recommend sip water, but it's a, it's a difficult one to quantify with clients. So it's best just to advise around sipping water and uh, to advise against gulping too much water. Um, it's also important to talk about overdose. A lot of clients don't think you can overdose on meth because they, they think about overdoses, um, you know, falling unconscious and dying more along the opiate kind of tradition. Uh, but it's important to say that you can overdose on meth. It just generally looks a little bit different. <laughs> Signs of overdose include the severe headache, confusion, disorientation, chest pain, vomiting or severe nausea, the rapid increase in heart rate, body temperature, regular breathing, 
high blood pressure, that extreme anxiety, panic and aggression, seizures and falling unconscious. If any of these happens or is you know, tending towards these, uh, you need to recommend that our clients get help immediately by going straight to a hospital, calling triple O and asking for ambulance. Um, in these situations, it's good to have the good basic um, you know, first aid chat, particularly demonstrating if your clients know about the recovery position if someone has fallen unconscious. So showing them how to do it is, is good and finding out if they know how to do CPR and to show or demonstrate these if you are competent and qualified. Um, <coughs> so if they're ever in a situation where they have to um, resuscitate someone while emergency help arrives. Uh, make sure they stay with the client, stay on the phone to Triple O if they need to, and to tell the ambulance officers and other medical staff exactly what's being taken. Um, now, a lot of people give advice to clients around saying, oh look, the police won't attend, you know, provided that there's no violence or aggression or any significant harm. Just be a little bit careful, we recommend about giving that advice because um, I think it's a little bit more complex than that. Uh, ambulance officers may call in police for a range of reasons. They may just detect a slight tone. They're a little bit jumpy around amphetamine at the moment. It might be a bit of a policy for some ambulance officers to always call police if it's an amphetamine overdose. Uh, the location of it, if it's deemed to be slightly out of the way or where the ambulance officers might feel vulnerable, they may indeed call police. So I think just giving that advice that police won't come is possibly a little bit dangerous uh, or ill-advised and just get the to think about when they're calling ambulance uh, that a police may arrive uh, and to uh, think about how they present the, the case or situation to minimize that um, so yeah it's also good to talk around um, the difference around the law in these circumstances a lot of people obviously are reluctant to call police because they're worried about getting busted themselves particularly if they have stuff on them a uh, good opportunity to explain that it's not illegal to be intoxicated on an illicit drug it's only illegal to possess or supply or traffic, but that also this applies to implements. Uh, so that if they are calling an ambulance, it's time to get rid of any s drug that's on them, hide the implements, get them away, uh, but they won't be charged just because uh, someone's intoxicated on an illicit substance. Uh, routes of administration. So we all know different ROAs have carry different risks, uh, so it's good to ask your client how he or she uses methamphetamine. Uh, it's important, as usual, to explain that injecting is the most risky way of using, followed by smoking, uh, but also that swallowing, snorting and rectal administration, shafting or plugging, also carry risks. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, why we say that smoking is particularly problematic is more because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's reinforcing habit-dependence habit kind of forming properties. Uh, it's really easy to initiate the smoking. Uh, anyone can do it. It doesn't take a genius to work out. Injecting obviously is a bit, a bit more problematic or a bit more kind of technical. Uh, and because of smoking is such an easy behaviour to pick up and replicate, you, we know that clients tend to use it a lot more and can develop dependence a lot faster from smoking. So whilst say with opiates we might recommend that clients jump down from smoking, uh, injecting to smoking, uh, with uh, amphetamines we'd ideally want them to go to swallowing uh, or as, uh, as a better option rather than smoking because of that tendency to form uh, dependence quickly. Uh, I won't go into a lot of detail around tips for people who inject because it's a whole workshop in itself. Uh, but if clients want to find out information, advise them to go to their nearest primary NSP and ask and check around method and technique. And if this is not available, there's a range of supply and print, resor print and video resources uh, available. And one of the most comprehensive is the Handy Hints Information Handbook by Newa. And there's the link to downloading that. I think it's like 190 pages long or something like that. Uh, but it's got everything in it and it was last updated in 2010. Uh, there's a shorter ABLE kind of double page brochure called A Guide to Safer Injecting and the Harm Reduction Coalition in the US have also got about a 90 page comprehensive resource called Getting Off Right. So you could provide these if you are not comfortable in providing that advice or they can't get to an NSP. Um, the newer website uh, also has some short videos they can watch which could be really useful. Uh, we're also uh, running a safe injecting workshop as part of the Insight workshop here in maybe October or November, early November uh, with the NSP downstairs and I believe there are seven spaces left for government workers and there's a wait list if they're not filled for our non-government friends. So if this is a topic you want to get uh, nitty gritty about, um, please attend that. 
Uh, so this isn't a complete list, but some of the key points we want to make around injecting methamphetamine is obviously not to inject alone, using new sterile equipment, never sharing equipment, which is a big, big message. Uh, methamphetamine can be quite toxic because of its highly chemical nature. So we want to make sure it's mixed up with plenty of sterile water. So tend to, <coughs> to mix up with more rather than less water. To always use a filter, often it's mixed with lots of cutting agents or other chemicals, particularly if they're using base or powder. Uh, so even if the mix looks clear, we still recommend that they use a filter. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other bits of technique around how you would actually get the filter out, which we're not going to go into here. Uh, obviously, rotating ejecting sites, and there's some sites, or there's a hierarchy of sites that you should use and sites that you should not use if it can be avoided, uh, which I won't go into detail again, and to disposable ejecting equipment safely in a rigid puncture-proof container. That's really important. We do know of cases where police have charged uh, clients or users around the remnant traces in barrels for a fits that haven't been disposed of properly. So I recommend that they use those yellow bins and seal them up and, and return them or, or dispose of them as soon as possible. Uh, now methamphetamine, when users uh, use it, uh, it tends to make veins shrink. Uh, often clients are also quite dehydrated because they forget to drink water or just drink alcohol when they're using. So if there's many clients whose veins are shrinking, uh, this can make injecting particularly difficult, so it can lead to misses, vein damage and abscesses. Uh, so there are a bunch of strategies to avoid that. Um, you know, making sure clients are very hydrated, drunk lots of water before they inject, and there are tips to help um, not miss as much and cause all that vein damage um, for clients who are already intoxicated. Uh, it would be fair to say that the majority of methane or ice users would smoke the drug uh, and it's easy for to have too much when smoking pipes and so we would, we would recommend that our clients do things like packing it away or putting it in a box and putting it in the cupboard in between use rather than just leaving it on the table where someone can just pick up and pack another pipe and before they know it they've had a really high dose and, and have all the negative effects that comes along with that. Uh, we know there are some little uh, harms around uh, overcooking the pipe with burnings to hands and lips. So uh, you try not to have the lighter directly on the pipe, but to warm up the pipe gradually and to let it cool down between use to avoid getting blistered or cracked lips. Uh, we would really recommend avoiding sharing pipes to reduce the risk of infection. Suggest that your client has his or her own pipe and maybe a spare one that guests use when they come along so that you don't have to share it around. Uh, to clean the pipe between use could also be um, another strategy. Uh, we would recommend that clients don't hold the heat in their lungs for too long. They don't need to. Um, the, it's, it rap it ab absorbs rapidly into the blood systems through the lungs, so they don't need to hold it in for 30 seconds to get the best heat out of it. Uh, and we would discourage them holding the pipe between their lips or teeth and avoid plugging the pipe with their tongue again for that sharing of infection and to rinse the mouth out after use uh, so that the traces of the drug that are on their gums and teeth don't cause uh, oral kind of infection or decay. And again, just making that point, they can rapidly lead to dependence, so I'd be conscious around that, around using pipes. Uh, a very small number of people will choose to administer the drug rectally or vaginally. Uh, uh, this is often referred to more colloquially as sharpening, plugging, baking, or shelving in the case of vaginal administration. Um, people will choose to use it because it has very high bioavailability. Bio so, uh, you know, reports up to like 99% bioavailable through the rectum. The only higher one is injecting, obviously. Uh, so, uh, people do like it because, again, it has that membrane for the direct blood barrier. So, it is safer than injecting. Um, but again, methamphetamine is quite toxic and caustic and can burn the sensitive lining of the rectum or vagina and there's risks of abscesses, ulcers, diarrhea, damage to the membrane and other bowel dysfunction. So regular uh, rectal administration or vaginal administration is not advised. Uh, a lot of clients report that it enhances uh, sexual experience or heightens sexual pleasure when they use it that way. So that's why it's used by some communities as opposed to other routes. Uh, so if they are going to use it, we recommend that they dissolve it in a lot of water and inject with a plastic oral syringe or an intravenous syringe with the tip broken off. Uh, we don't recommend direct insertion of, of crystal methamphetamine directly into the anus because it'll, I mean, you don't need to tell them that. If they try it, they'll probably never do it again. It'll hurt so much. Um, and yeah, so we would recommend against that. 
Um, for people who snort or insufflate uh, methamphetamine, again, it's quite toxic. It can burn the lining of the nasal passage and down the back of the throat, causing nosebleeds, sinusitis, uh, and or necrosis of the septum. So that's where it kind of gets eaten away for repeated use. Um, again, similar to smoking, we would avoid sharing. I recommend avoiding sharing straws or banknotes to avoid sharing infections of minute droplets of blood. Uh, and clients may wish to rinse out the nasal passage with warm, potentially salty water after use. Um, by the way, you might have some other tips which I'm going to ask for you at the end of this presentation from your direct practice. So if you think of things, keep them in mind because I want to find out what else we can add to this list as it grows. Um, a lot of our clients will have, want specific issues or ex experience specific harms and uh, let's talk about them really quickly. So sleep problems are one of the major ones that are the biggest downside of regular meth use or even um, recreational use. Uh, it affects the amount and quality and so we want to recommend that our clients if possible have a safe comfortable place to crash when the time comes and if advised particularly if they're feeling scattered or paranoid in the come down phase if they've got good food and drink stocked up there they can hold up in their cave for a few days until they feel better without having to avoid eating or going out into public if they don't feel like it um, we recommend clients having a downtime or a break from physical activity, particularly if they're a dependent user, and to not ignore signs of tiredness. So if they feel tired, tell them to go to bed and not try to stretch it out if their body tells them it's ready. I know regular sleep hygiene advice, we would often tell people that if they're having trouble falling to sleep in bed to get up and you know, maybe have something to eat or have a drink of water and go back to bed when they feel tired. Um, we probably wouldn't advise that with clients who are using methamphetamine um, because if it's probably better for them if they are so sleep deprived just to lie in bed until they fall asleep and they because eventually they will if they get up it's likely that they will just stay up longer and longer and longer uh, so and preferably we would advise them to try and go to bed at the same time so even if they're intoxicated try to go to bed at 10 o'clock and maybe lie there until you fall asleep you'll fall asleep a lot faster uh, than if you um, try to eke it out uh, and avoid getting to the pattern of staying up all night and sleeping all day. Um, if struggling to get to sleep, maybe a warm shower, not a warm bath. Obviously, we don't want our clients to uh, fall asleep in the bath, so a warm shower and a warm milky drink, even though the sleep enhancing amino acids affect it quite very mild. Psychologically, I think from our childhood, we all think a glass of milk helps us sleep and that could have some sort of benefits. Uh, and also sleep relax relaxation exercises such as that tensing and relaxing every part of the body and focusing on my help uh, center and relax someone who's struggling to get to sleep. One of the key bits of advice we want to give to our clients is advise against uh, using uh, sedatives or um, depressants such as opal, op alcohol, opiates and benzodiazepines. Uh, the risk is that they overload on these drugs while they're uh, intoxicated, while they're stimulated, and then the amphetamines bear off and then they all kick in and there's a risk of CNS depressants or um, you know, passing, out of, or, um, pa uh, or passing away once those drugs kind of kick in. So that's a key risk is to... Now we know a lot of our clients will use Valiums and other kind of uh, benzos uh, at the end to help them get to sleep. Um, so if they are doing that, just make sure that they know that there are those risks and to go easy, I guess. A diet and nutrition is also very important for our methamphetamine users. Um, regular users obviously can experience malnutrition quite quickly. Um, and we also know that people, people no matter how kind of chaotic your life is and your meth use is, you still probably want to look good and appearance is often a real big motivator for people so it's a really good way to try to get some healthy messages into our clients. Um, so suggest that they eat before using and to at least eat one meal each day, avoid uh, takeaway or junk food but instead a balanced diet of course of protein, vegetables, fruits, cereals uh, and dairy products. We can sell that he healthy eating message by edu educating our clients that uh, the body needs proteins in combination with vegetables to naturally produce dopamine and that, and that the low feeling they get from their come down will be lessened if they eat a good serve of meat and veg because it'll um, start their body producing dopamine more naturally so it'll make them feel better and that teaching them that little bit might help sell the message around at least trying to get some veggie or protein and veggies into their diet. 
Uh, a lot of clients will say they can't physically eat from methamphetamine, they are dehydrated, they can't, the swallowing reflex is affected. Uh, so suggest our nutritious and easy to swallow meals such as fruit, smoothies, yogurt, cereal, milk, soup and pasta. Stuff that's easy to swallow to keep their nutrition levels up. Uh, oral hygiene and oral care is also a really big issue to talk about. Uh, methamphetamine dries out the mouth which can cause teeth and gum problems. So good old brushing, brushing and flossing every day. Uh, if teeth grinding is an issue, recommend chewing a sugar-free gum uh, as long-term grinding can crack and damage teeth. And regular rinsing of the mouth, particularly if smoking methamphetamine to wash away some of those remnant traces. Obviously, <coughs> discourage picking at the skin. Uh, particularly if they're starting to develop sores from uh, poor he health and hygiene as this can spread infection. Good old, just talking about how often do you shower and recommending daily showers and ensuring general checkups with you know, GPs, dentists, sexual health clinics, etc. Safe sex is an issue. We know a lot of people may use methamphetamine to enhance or increase sexual experiences. So recommend or provide condoms and water-based lubricants. Um, recommend breaks if engaging in prolonged sexual activity, so, you know, to give your organs a break. Um, think of ways that they might uh, avoid unwanted or regretted sex before their binge or before their weekend, uh, and the buddy system might be a part of that. Um, and it's important that we also warn against the risks of mixing stimulants with Viagra. Uh, a lot of, some users report not being able to get or maintain erections when they're using methamphetamine, so I tended to use Viagra, and the combination of those can create a lot of stress on the heart, uh, so a risk of heart attack or priapism. Does anyone know what priapism is? Yeah. See, oh, yeah. It's the opposite. It's um, a, an, an erection that won't go away for many hours, and it can be quite painful and quite a serious issue, so uh, it's an erection that might last like four hours or longer, and be very uncomfortable. Um, now, <coughs> a lot of young people would think, no, how could that be uncomfortable, but <laughs> I, I trust the medical reports that it is. Uh, uh, there was a hashtag chemsex came out a few weeks ago, or months ago, uh, there was a Vice documentary about it, so um, yeah, uh, it is an issue. Uh, I mean, why uh, chemsex is such a big difference to alcohol sex, I don't know, but apparently it's a thing. Uh, mental health and head health is another issue, so um, you know, it's not uncommon for our clients to experience low levels or levels of anxiety, low mood, depression, and psychosis. Clients may often report feeling scattered after they've come down, uh, particularly if they've been using for a few days. Um, look, generally, it's a sign if our clients are feeling scattered to take a break and catch up on sleep. If they can't sleep, encourage them to find a safe place to relax. Um, let them know that they're already feeling sad, angry or anxious or an existing mental health issue that using meth can exacerbate or make these things worse, particularly during the come down period. Um, you might want to talk about psychosis as well if, and what are, what is psychosis and explain that, you know, so start to see, hear, feel things that aren't there or think that people are out to get them, that this could be a sign of psychosis. Um, it might, instead of challenging them about theirs, it might be asking if they know someone who is experiencing this or these symptoms, and so as a way that's so not so confrontational, <coughs> that uh, clients with psychosis are vulnerable and need help. And that most people who probably experience psychotic symptoms, in the re research says that generally they go away after two to three hours, and you know, a good long sleep or a couple of days of not using and it'll go away. Uh, but if it persists or is very serious, um, they'll need to get immediate help um, and escorted to you know, a hospital, etc. Uh, obviously the way that it's done is really important because that can be quite a terrifying experience for clients, particularly if they're feeling that persecutory paranoia which is associated particularly with methamphetamine psychosis. Uh, and also that you know, a lot of people will claim that smoking cannabis will help you relax and with a come down, but if you're experiencing psychotic symptoms, these may make things worse. So to be aware of that. Um, so yeah, and there are a bunch of tips if um, if our client has a loved one or you know who is has increasing aggression. I won't go through because of time, but there's a whole bunch of things they should do to uh, de-escalate the situation. Um, you know, particularly around not being too argumentative, being reassuring, 
Uh, and also it might be about managing other people around the affected client, particularly if police or health staff are involved. It might be about having a quiet conversation a way to say, hey, this person's feeling particularly agitated and aggressive. Just be aware of that in your manner and warning those medical staff before they approach your client or your friend. It might be a good piece of advice so that it doesn't escalate and cause all the nasty stuff that we uh, associate through the media uh, with methamphetamine. Uh, really quickly, <coughs> obviously pregnants and preg parents of pregnant women should be advised against using meth. Uh, it's not only while intoxicated, but during the come down period, um, you might want to talk about how methamphetamine can affect children, and that they may need to talk with children to help them understand what is happening. We know that methamphetamine use during pregnancy carries a whole bunch of pretty serious risks, including preterm delivery, miscarriage, birth defects, and other complications, and that they need to seek immediate medical advice if they're pregnant. Uh, and you know you might do a assisted referral in this case. Uh, and finally, if they are considering cutting back or quitting methamphetamine, it's important to let them know that, and this is an advice for all drugs potentially, that it's likely that they may feel worse before they feel better. Uh, there's nothing like telling someone that, or people believing that as soon as they quit meth they're going to feel great, they're going to get their life back on track, and the reality is quite the opposite. A heavy user with that depletion of the dopamine stores can feel low mood or depression for many weeks or months, even up to a year in very heavy cases. And they need to be prepared for that and have strategies to deal with that before they attempt it to help them improve their chances of maintaining their abstinence or their reduced use. Um, they might also find that they're amotivated or anhedonia can not struggle to feel any sort of pleasure, uh, reassure them that these are normal signs of recovery and as your body is readjusting for the drug and will improve over time. And that, you know, it may take a few attempts and that slip-ups are learning opportunities rather than failures and celebrating any small steps as positive wins. And lastly, we can really only tell our clients that in the absence of a real pharmacotherapeutic bullet or treatment response, uh, all we really have is healthy food diet getting good sleep, avoiding triggers, so people or places uh, associated with using meth. Uh, regular exercise uh, is you know, magical in a whole range of effects and re-engagement or engagement in hobbies or activities, particularly ones that they used to get better or enjoy or get benefit from before they started using meth. And that includes hanging out with people who don't use drugs is a really key part of that. So our core messages that are in some of our treatment uh, resources which are about to be released are that you know, help is available, treatment works, uh, people can and do make successful changes around their methamphetamine use every day and that you know, all those things I just mentioned help. So yeah, so just really quickly, in terms of what treatment is available, we know that you know, there are some uh, medicines that help in withdrawal management, uh, particularly diazepam, but antidepressants uh, don't have any significant effect uh, in treating methamphetamine withdrawal, and there are no pharmacotherapies approved for use. Uh, there's no medicine that's been approved for treatment of withdrawal of the dependence. There's some maybe benefit of modafinil, mirtazapine, and dexamphetamine, uh, but they're limited, uh, and, and so yeah, there's no necessarily approved approach at this stage. What treatment approaches do work that we're aware of is the good old-fashioned you know, cognitive behavioural therapy, particularly ACT and relapse prevention, uh, motivational interviewing, uh, residential rehabilitation will work for people who are long-term regular users, uh, and that's uh, coupled with mutual support groups and proactive follow-up is proven to have better results. And no surprise, uh, harm reduction, particularly through NSPs and other events, have good evidence around their effectiveness. So. Um, Look, if you want more information around methamphetamine, these are some of the Insight record, um, webinars that we had last semester, which you can go back and view on our Vimeo channel, access via our website if you want to know more. And there are some free e-learning packages from the CEDA Pennington Institute, plus we've got our own one, which will be coming out in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, Lee Gen uh, have also got some great um, resources that can be downloaded and printed, and there's the link to get to them. Uh, we have ADIS and also family drug support are our key contact points. That's me, that's, so that's some of the key harm reduction advice that we have around methamphetamine. I'm keen to throw it out to the floor um, to find out if you've got any great bits of advice that we can share with our colleagues in the room or in webinar land that you might suggest to your methamphetamine using clients. I just wondered, Jeff, if we might do the webinar questions first. Sure, go for it. Yeah. Yep.
We've got a few there. The first one's asking um, if the emergency departments are seeing a lot of people with intoxication related to paranoia and brief delusional ideas. Um, any thoughts and comment around that? Well, that's my understanding. There's a lot of... Um, so maybe a typical picture is someone who's been using and either has had too much or has, at the end of a long run uh, is experiencing paranoia and psychotic experiences people are panicked, they call police or they're drawn to the attention of police, they're then escorted by the police to emergency departments, it's all escalating um, and that's when some of those kind of spectacular kind of blow-ups kind of happen. Uh, we can see from those initial stats that there is an increase in, in presentations to emergency departments and hospitals for psychotic behaviour. Uh, but I, I also would like to stress that, I mean, that's a very serious, and I use the word spectacular kind of presentation. It's not the norm, it just gets all of the media. Um, so yes, it does happen and it's really full on when it does, uh, but that's you know still, compared to the number of people who are using methamphetamine, quite rare. But yeah, I mean, I don't work in emergency departments, but that would be my guess. Can I just add to the, the statement from the floor is that a lot of emergency department presentations are in combination with alcohol. And it would be fair to say that a whole lot of our clients would be drinking pretty much constantly while using methamphetamine. Uh, methamphetamine reduces the intoxication experience to some extent, so people feel they can drink a lot more. Uh, they often forget to hydrate with water, so it could be a number of days of steady drinking, and then that all culminates with lack of sleep. And also, you know, we know that the dopamine system uh, affects impulsivity and also is related to experiences of psychosis along with the serotonin system. So, you know, it's a recipe for culminating in those experiences. Other questions? There's another question, Diff. Um, you mentioned avoiding myths, re ad, uh, what is it? Avoid, avoiding myths, re advice, and messages. What are some of the myths? Uh, a lot of the myths is that, yeah, powdered speed is amphetamine. Uh, there are a lot of myths around injecting, around, um, you know, uh, Know, the, the process, people get very wedded to a particular behaviour, particularly if they've been doing it for a while, so there might be things around, you know, use of tourniquets and holding it all in there so that when you release a tourniquet you get a bigger rush. There might be things around, um, you know, um, using it to enhance sexual experiences. It might be myths, I don't know, you might hear some of the myths on the floor. Um, around, uh, you know, often the snow cones that you would smoke ice in combination with heroin to get a particular effect. Um, a, a lot of, there's a lot of those kind of myths that get around drug using circles and groups of friends. And not a lot of it which is based on reality. I don't know what the, the actual effect of snow cones are. I don't know why people would do it to be honest. Um, but obviously that's a myth that I've heard for the many years that I've been working in this area. Are the myths that people hear on the floor that they have to correct? I was just going to say, I've heard just in recent months to a year or so, there's a slight decline in meth use in the United States and a resurgence yep. of opioids. Yep. I was wondering if anything like that has started to occur here yet. Yeah, look, I'm not aware of the exact rates, but we certainly hear an increase in the availability of prescription opioids and fentanyl and other synthetic opioids, which are causing a bunch of problems and deaths in other states. So I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if that is an issue. Um, but I don't know what the rates of use. I mean, it's really... We don't have good data on methamphetamine or drug use generally in this country. We really much rely on the National Drug Strategy Household Survey, which is a number of uh, unavoidable flaws in its methodology. And it only comes out every three or four years, its whole population kind of trends. Uh, we do have, uh, you know, we can line up some of the drug use monitoring, uh, Duma research and some of the, um, what's the police one or is that Duma? Is the police one. Uh, to try and correlate trends, but yeah, I don't know, to be honest. But uh, look, uh, if we're hearing more of it in the media, I wouldn't be surprised if that's a reflection of more on the ground. And I've heard anecdotally from some people around increased availability of synthetic opiates, as I'm sure you have as well in frontline land. Whether that's eating into users who were traditionally maybe opiate users switched to crystal methamphetamine because of its availability and now would switch back, I wouldn't be surprised. People tend to have their drug of choice uh, and will use have a hierarchy and we'll use that drug and if it's not available, move down. And for, if opiate users are struggling to find heroin or prescriptions, they will probably move to crystal methamphetamine and once the opiates are available, again, switch back. So it's likely to follow that trend. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, 
the uh, best way of getting a high is uh, IV rather than smoking. I would have yep. thought smoking diffuses into the bloodstream just as quickly, if not quicker, than IV. Yeah, I um, I think it is. I think it's just a few more minutes for smoking than injecting. But I think the peak plasma is actually about two and a half to three hours. And that's an interesting point to make as well for smokers, which I forgot to mention, is that people will smoke and the, the, the vapors are actually sitting on their mucosa in their lungs. And it actually takes a couple of hours before that is a peak concentration in their blood system. So people are smoking lots and lots of pipes and then they are not experiencing their peak for many hours later. So yeah, that's my understanding of peak plasma, but I'm happy to be corrected by the more medical staff in the, in the, in the building. Yeah. One of the um, um, reduction tips is around picking their skin. Yes. Um, so you mentioned pulling their hands, you know, yeah. um, try not to pick. And if it does get infected, then they might need an antibiotic to yeah to get rid of the infection. Yeah, that's really good. And any other behavioural things like wearing gloves or things that stops them from picking their skin could be other tips for people for that compulsive, what is it, um, delusional parasitosis or, you know, for people who are you know, compulsively skin picking. Yeah. Um, yeah, just the harm reduction point around like helping yourself keep safe when you're obtaining methamphetamine, uh, yes. particularly for young women. Yes. Um, you know, trying to find a dealer where you can, where you have some trust and just the financial management side yes. of things and the stress related to drug debt and the you know kind of threat of harm involved in that. Really good point, Claire, around the particular risks facing female injectors, particularly young, or not just injectors, female substance users, particularly younger ones. Uh, we also know that there's increased risks of hep C transmission for young female injectors because their older male injecting friend will usually inject first uh, and also potentially can use the drug as a power, you know, in terms of giving too much or too little to their female partner. Uh, and yeah, so there's a whole bunch of risks that women experience, thanks for pointing it out. There's also a whole, if we had more time, there's a whole bunch of legal harms that we can help our clients to avoid by explaining the law a lot better, particularly around, you know, there's um, what supply is. Uh, I forgot to mention diversion, you know, that people who use ice are eligible for diversion if they're in possession of less than one gram. And so that's a good piece of advice to give our clients is not to carry large amounts of methamphetamine or any drug around with them and if they've got under a gram and no pre-existing uh, they would be eligible for diversion and avoid a criminal record. Uh, same with implements. Um, there's laws around aggravated supply so if you're a younger user and you're passing a pipe around and you're 18 you pass it to a 17 year old uh, that is uh, a higher charge of aggravated supply as opposed to supply to an adult because that's deemed a supply to a minor. No, the, the, the law doesn't distinguish between an 8 year old and a 17 year old in those situations so this is, I mean they're huge and there's a whole bunch of generic gear yeah, harm reduction we should be talking around with our clients and um, yeah maybe we should look at some of those as a future topics the more generic harm reduction advice okay well we don't have any more questions from the floor I don't think um, so I'm sure you'll all join me in thanking Jeff thanks very much Jeff for that presentation today and I'll just remind people that um,